Section 20 of Birds and Nature, Volume 8, Number 3, October 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by C. Maury. The Geological Succession of Fishes In discussing this subject, it will be necessary to say something about the geological history of the Earth. Each geological age had its own peculiar fauna, and to write about any part of it means that we must know something about the particular geological age in which the animals under consideration flourished, and something of the Earth's previous history. The Earth is supposed to be a small, condensed portion of the gaseous material, which, astronomers tell us, at one time pervaded all space. The heat given off when the gas was condensing has largely been converted into mechanical energy, which makes the Earth revolve once in 24 hours and sends it flying through space. As soon as the Earth decreased to about its present size and became cool enough for water to be condensed on its surface, it began to write its own history. Its entire surface may have at one time been covered to a uniform depth by water. If such was ever the case, it did not remain so long. The interior of the earth was very hot, and the crust cooled very irregularly, and portions of it rose above the surface of the water. Since then, there have been two antagonizing forces at work. The heat caused the earth's surface to become irregular, and the water has made a strong effort, which it has been partially successful, to reduce all irregularities to the same level. We do not know how long these forces nearly balanced each other, but sooner or later, Dry land appeared in many places on the Earth's surface. This was for a long period of time washed by heavy rains, while the shores for some distance seaward were worn away by the action of tidal waves. Much of the land area then sank below sea level and became covered with sand, gravel, and the like. The portion which remained above sea level is called the Archean. Later, a general elevation of the land area brought above sea level much of this land and gravel, forming around the Archean an increased land area, which we will call Silurian. The time when the sand and gravel was deposited forming this land is known as the Silurian Age. Following this came the Devonian Age. After this, in the following order, came the following geological eras. Carboniferous, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, Tertiary, Quaternary, and then the present or recent age, the one in which we now live. Each of these ages is characterized by peculiar animals which then predominated, and these animals are known only from their remains embedded in the rocks as fossils. It may not be out of place here to mention that the rocks are usually placed in two great classes. Those which have been subjected to great heat, melted or partly so at one time, then cooled and hardened are called metamorphic or igneous rock. To those belong such rocks as are granites. Those which have not been changed by heat are called sedimentary rocks, such as sandstones, limestones, etc. In the former class, we find no fossils. If fossils ever existed there, the fusing of the rocks has destroyed them. Sedimentary rocks contain many fossils. The Archean area contains no sedimentary rocks, hence no fossils. Between the close of the Archean and the beginning of the Silurian, is a long interval of which we know nothing. Life evidently existed then, for at the close of this interval, or rather the beginning of the Silurian, we find a large number of invertebrates. There were corals, crinoids, brachiopods, lamella branches, gastropods, cephalopods, worms, and crustaceans. All of these animals flourished during the Silurian. It was during the latter part of the Silurian that fishes first made their appearance. If they lived earlier than this, they were of low organization and possessed no hard parts, and when they died, they would entirely decay, leaving nothing to be preserved as fossils. Of course, no one lived then to give these fishes easy common names, so we only know them by the long, hard, scientific names given by scientific men. These we will use as little as possible in this article. In classifying fishes, they fall into a few large groups, as follows. The lowest fish in point of structure is the lancelet, a small, semi-transparent animal with no hard parts as teeth, spines, or bones. We would not expect it to be preserved as a fossil, and so we find none. The next group contains our lampreys and hagfishes. These are parasites. 
They vary in length from a few inches to more than three feet. With a mouth nearly circular, they attach themselves to other fishes and feast upon their blood. The hagfish eats its way into the fish and remains there until the host is a living hulk of skin and bones. Fishes known as teresbids, thought by some scientists to belong to this group, are found in the upper part of the Silurian. The lampreys of present day have no very hard teeth, and their backbone is simply very soft cartilage. These ancient lampreys, called teresbids, had the head and part of the body covered with a coat of mail. Of these, there flourished in the last days of the Silurian quite a number of species. The next group of fishes are the sharks the most bloodthirsty of all the inhabitants of the sea. Sharks flourish to some extent in the upper part of the Silurian. The shark has no true bones, and its covering consists of chagrin tentacles. It is provided with hard teeth, and the dorsal fins of the ancient shark were provided each with a hard, stout spine. The teeth were large, flat, and fit for crushing. We know these ancient sharks only by the spines, chagrin tentacles, and the teeth. These, however, furnished abundant evidence that the sharks in the upper Silurian were numerous as to the individuals and species. The chimera, a fish much resembling the sharks, was also abundant in the upper Silurian. A group of fishes usually known as ganoids, and which comprise the lung fishes of the Nile, of Australia, and the garpikes of North America, and the sturgeons, were very abundant during the closing days of the Silurian. The fishes of this group are especially well preserved as fossils. Their coverings consisted of bony plates or bucklers, or of scales covered with a coat of enamel. Their outer covering was well suited to become fossilized, and so we know this group much better than we do any other found in the Silurian. The next and last group of the fishes is known as the teleosts, or bony fishes. To this group belong our typical fishes, such as the black bass, sunfishes, suckers, catfish, and the like. None of this group lived during the Silurian. Following the Silurian came the Devonian, which is called the Age of Fishes. In no time in the world's history have fishes been so large and so abundant as during this age. They outclassed in every respect all other animals. The same general types flourished as those which existed in the latter part of the Silurian. There were many more species and more individuals, and some grew to an enormous size. Fishes ruled the Devonian seas. The crustaceans, such as trilobites, which greatly predominated during the Silurian age, diminished greatly during the Devonian. In the struggle for existence, they decreased in size and in numbers, and were obliged to seek safety in less favorable places. The Devonian fishes were largely sharks and ganoids, especially the latter. These were covered with hard, enamel-coated scales or bony plates. Some were short and heavy, entirely encased in a covering of large bony plates. They were evidently anything but pretty, and their movements in the water must have been extremely awkward. Others were formed much after our own idea of fishes. These bore much resemblance to our garpikes, the lungfish of the Nile and the lungfish of Australia, and the worthless dogfish of our own fresh waters. Anglers and fishermen all despise these fishes now, yet in the Devonian times the fishes most nearly like them were evidently the most handsome and graceful of all the fishes living then. It appears as if fishes in those days did not fight each other. They found abundant sea room and plenty of food in the form of invertebrates. Of course, it is quite possible that many fish-like animals existed at this time, but possessing no hard parts, and were not preserved as fossils. These could not become at all important, for the seas were too full of large animals of all classes, which were so well protected with a coat of mail and so hostile that those less favorably suited could not exist in any great numbers. At the close of the Devonian, many changes took place. The rocks of this formation, which now form a portion of the Earth's surface, rose out of the water, and the land area thus considerably increased. The seasons, such as they were then, became more marked. Many inland seas were formed. These changes were more or less gradual, but not so much so that the fishes living then could not suit themselves to the new conditions. Those fishes which had flourished for generations and had become accustomed to easy living and certain fixed ways could not adapt themselves to changing conditions, and so became extinct. The teraspids, the earliest forms to appear, 
the pterichthys, and in fact all forms which bear any resemblance to our present lampreys, or which may prove a close relative of the earlier ganoids, became extinct at the close of the Devonian. The early chimeras which flourished from the close of the Silurian also became extinct. Many ganoids became extinct, but other ganoids came into existence to take their places. The ganoids most nearly like our modern sturgeons increased during the last of the Devonian and retained their prominence to the close of the Carboniferous. The slow-moving, heavily plated ganoids passed away. They ruled during the Devonian age, but could not suit themselves to the new conditions at the beginning of the Carboniferous. While fishes were numerous and large in the Devonian, throughout the Carboniferous they began to decline. By this time, the land area had much increased, land plants became very abundant, there were immense forests of tropical vegetation, great swamps and peat bogs, all of which later sank below sea level, became covered up, and changed into coal. Immense lizards lived in these forests and along the seashores. These were the first land animals. At the close of the Carboniferous, great changes took place greater changes than at any time since the close of the Archean. So marked were the changes at this time that it marks a new era in the geological history of Earth. All preceding the close of the Carboniferous is regarded as ancient geology, all since as the modern geology. It was at this time that plants and animals were represented by new forms more like those living now. The geological age following the Carboniferous is the Triassic, with this age began our modern sharks and fishes. They did not become abundant until the Jurassic and Cretaceous. All of the earlier sharks had strong spines in the front of each dorsal fin and broad teeth made for crushing. One form of these, known as cestraceonts, were very abundant until the end of the Cretaceous. In the early Triassic, they began to decline and the sharks with pointed teeth increased. These sharks, with pointed teeth but rounded on the edges, commenced back in the Carboniferous. During the Triassic, the sharks with lancet-shaped teeth, such as are now possessed by nearly all our sharks, commenced in small numbers. One of the important differences between ganoids and the teleosts, or true fishes, is the tail vertebrae. In the ganoids, the tail vertebrae decrease gradually in size and curve upwards in the upper lobe of the tail. In the teleosts, the tail vertebrae ends a short distance in front of the ends of the middle fin rays of the tail fin. In the ganoids, the upper lobe of the tail fin is the largest. In the teleosts, both lobes are nearly the same size. The tail of the ganoid fish is called a heterocircle. That of our modern, or teleost fishes, is homocircle. The tail of the early ganoids was strongly heterocircle. In the Triassic and Jurassic, its lobes, in many cases, became nearly equal, approaching the homocircle tail. The tails of the sharks are heterocircle. Of all modern fishes, it is homocircle except in a few families. As the cod and related fishes, it is isocircle. That is, the vertebrae decrease in size but do not form an upward curve. So far as we know, the shad family is the first of our teleosts or true fishes to appear and these were quite abundant in the early part of the Triassic. The rays, fish-like animals, much like sharks, but with the body and fins flattened or spread out in a broad, flat disc, appeared in the Jurassic. The chimeras, so abundant in the Devonian, and which died out apparently at the close of the Devonian, also reappeared at the beginning of the Jurassic. These did not belong to the same families as did the more ancient chimeras. The chimeras, no doubt, flourished in the Carboniferous and the Triassic, but migrated to some portion of the sea where now, perhaps, their remains lie buried in rock below the bottom of the sea. Their survivors, which were able to modify their structure and habits to become suited to new conditions, returned in modified forms to the Jurassic, where in time their remains come to the surface as fossils. At the end of the Cretaceous, or beginning of the Tertiary, we find all modern types of sharks and all the important orders of the teleosts. The sturgeons and ganoids decrease throughout the tertiary and quaternary until at present we have but few living species. The sturgeons are the more abundant. Of the large group of ganoids, so abundant during all these geological ages, but few forms are living today. These are the Ceridotus, lungfish of Australia, the polypterus of the Nile, and the prototurus of western Africa, the dogfish, and the three garpike of North America. These few species 
are but the remnants of a once large and extensive group of fishes. In the study of fishes, we notice that some are highly specialized so far as their structures are concerned. The teeth of some become especially fitted for a peculiar kind of food, and as a result quite unfit for any other kind. Some, to be protected from their enemies, develop a heavy armor, which only retards their activity. Other fishes are more generalized, that is, are of medium size, omnivorous habits, and are not hampered in their movements by a too heavy coat of mail, etc. When any change of conditions came to modify their habits of living, the specialized were always the first to disappear. Being particularly fitted for one mode of life made them all the more unfitted for any other, and so when the conditions changed, they perished. All of our modern fishes, except for the few ganoids, are more or less specialized. The trout lives in cool running water, and some varieties can live in no other, while some fishes have become accustomed to warm, stagnant water and cannot live without the trout. What is true in the respect of fishes is true in the land animals as well. The large, ponderous, slow-moving reptiles of the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, and the large mammals of the Tertiary and Quaternary could not exist except under the peculiar conditions of that time, and, sooner or later, had to give way to the smaller, more active, and more resourceful animals of their class. In tracing the history of fishes from their earliest existence to present, one is struck with the myriad of forms he finds. It would seem that all possible effort was made by them to modify their structure to suit their environment. When this changed, all efforts came to naught, and they were destined to give way to the more favored kinds. Seth E. Meek End of section 20「Section 21 of Birds and Nature, Volume 8, Number 3, October 1900, recorded for LibriVox.org by Nemo. The Deep There is beauty in the deep. The wave is bluer than the sky, and, though the light shine bright on high, more softly do the sea-gems glow that sparkle in the depths below. The rainbow's tints are only made when, on the waters, they are laid, and sun and moon most sweetly shine upon the ocean's level brine. There's beauty in the deep. There's music in the deep. It is not in the surf's rough roar, nor in the whispering, shelly shore. They are but earthly sounds that tell how little of the sea nymph's shell that sends its loud, clear note abroad or winds its softness through the flood, echoes through groves of coral gay, and dies on spongy banks away. There's music in the deep. There's quiet in the deep. Above let tides and tempest rave, and earth-born whirlwinds wake the wave. Above let care and fear contend with sin and sorrow to the end. Here, far beneath the tainted foam, that frets above our peaceful home. We dream in joy and wake in love, nor know the rage that yells above. There's quiet in the deep. John G. C. Brainard. End of section 21. This recording is in the public domain. Section 22 of Birds and Nature, Volume 8, Number 3, October 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Red Start, Cetophaga ruticilla. Contemporaneous with the blossoming out of the wild plum, the early Richmond cherry, and a rich and diversified profusion of woodland flowers, perhaps better exemplified on this occasion by such interesting types as the little claytonia, or spring beauty, the rue anemone, and the trilliums, both tiorectum and grandiflorum, with perhaps a few belated blossoms of the hepatica, is the advent of this interesting little bird among us which here in northeastern Illinois usually plans its arrival somewhere near the closing days of the first week in May. 
its generic name cetophaga interpreted into plainer english means a devourer of insects and were we to select from among the large and varied assortment of birds comprising the bulk of our warbler hosts a form most elegant and expressive of gaiety sprightliness and in measure frivolity we could not go far wrong in determining upon this species so easily outclassing all others as the most brilliantly colored member of that numerously large and interesting family the neotiltidae at first a creeper and sharp-eyed inspector of hidden crannies we afterwards discern no less in him and upon the slightest provocation a tyrant on the wing thereby proving a general adaptability to and utility in his calling at all stages of the game a constant warfare directed against the insect horde to which he devotes himself most assiduously at all times and it is really astonishing the amount of the minute forms of insect life these little birds will consume so then what at first may appear to us as clever acts of trifling weight will upon closer inspection prove carefully executed movements planned and carried out with the greatest precision among ornithologists we find it classed as an interesting member of the group of fly-catching warblers equally suggestive to the mind of the writer would be the name of the fan-tailed warbler derived from its well-known habit of carrying the tail slightly elevated and partly spread to those who may be on the lookout for just such marked characteristics among our birds this one feature alone will serve as an excellent index in determining its proper identification the plainer and grayer markings of the female and immature birds may differ very considerably from the more pronounced black and white orange-red and salmon-colored blotches of the adult male but never so strikingly manifesting themselves in the markings of the tail which in either case may appear to the casual observer as quite similar yet if we examine them more critically we will discover that they are distinctly different the salmon red and black tipped feathers of the male bird being replaced by a paler reddish yellow and grayer tipped arrangement in the case of the female young males have the darker markings of the tail feathers very similar to those of the adult birds which we are told do not take on the complete dress until the third year but the habit of constantly flitting the tail in fan-like motions is peculiar alike to all phases of this bird's plumage and above all other characteristics serve as the greatest aid in naming it the very young or nestling dress of which little or nothing seems to have been written bears a partial resemblance to that of the female bird excepting that the wings are crossed by two yellowish bands caused by the lighter tippings of the outer coverts the yellow breast spots of the female are also wanting in this dress for further particulars the reader is kindly referred to the colored plate accompanying this article like the robin redbreasts the name of the red start seems to have been brought to america by the early settlers who were ever on the watch for familiar objects to remind them of former days and as in the case of the example just cited wrongfully ascribed by them to a far different bird an analogy however exists in the coloration of the european and american birds justifying in a measure the reason for so naming it we are told in newton's dictionary of birds that the red start the ruticilla phonicurus of most ornithologists is well known in great britain where it is also called the fire tail from the word start which in the original anglo-saxon steort means tail but the english bird is very different from ours throughout a marked distinction being its peculiarity of habit in seeking out for a nesting site a hole in a tree or ruined building our bird contrary to all this more correctly builds its nest out of doors usually selecting the upright forks of some tall shrub or small tree and placing therein a neat compact structure in which four or five light-colored eggs are deposited that in their spotted appearance and blotching of various shades of brown resemble very closely the eggs of the common yellow warbler dendroica aestiva but for all this however it repairs to the shadier depths of the woods while the yellow warbler on the other hand seeks out the more tangled thickets and willow copses 
the song of the red start too bears in a striking degree a very close resemblance to that of this same yellow warbler though as in the case of the nest the localities frequented by it serve readily in making a distinction in general tone and quality as professor lynds jones has remarked in number thirty of the wilson bulletin warbler songs there is a strong resemblance to the yellow but the range of variation is greater and the song distinctly belongs to the ringing aisles of the woods the common utterance can be recalled by che 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 pa the last syllable abruptly falling and weakening a soft song is like we see we see we with the suggestion at least of a lower pitch for the last syllable the range of the american red star is quite extended including as we may say all of north america though it is very rare and irregular in the states west of the sierras it is said to breed from kansas northward tabulated observations compiled by the writer at glen ellen illinois during the past seven years show that the southward movement of the red start commences about the end of the first week in august the first part of september finds them common after which their numbers gradually wane the last of the month or the first few days in october witnessing its final departure benjamin true galt End of section 22、section、23 of Birds and Nature, Volume 8, Number 3, October 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avayi. In March 2017. Section 23. The Flying Fish. All animals are provided with some means of protection from the attacks of their enemies and with ways of escaping from any object which they may fear. The means furnished to the flying fishes is one of the most unique and interesting. To escape the larger fishes that prey upon them, or when frightened by a passing vessel, these fishes will rise from the surface of the water, and with distended but quiet fins pass over a distance of several feet. They have been known to rise to a height of twelve or more feet, and fly for one hundred or more yards, although the height and distance travelled is usually much less. This power of flight is due to the great development of the breast, pectoral fins situated on the sides of the body near the head some writers have stated that these fishes left the water for the purpose of catching insect food and that they had the power of regulating their flight by the movement of their fins the best authorities however claim that they do not possess the power of changing the direction velocity or altitude of their flight and the position of the fins is not voluntarily changed, and that their object in leaving the water is not for food. They rise without reference to the direction of the wind or waves, and frequently, when their course is at an angle with the wind, the direction of their flight may be changed by the air currents or by contact with the waves. The direction is also modified when passing close to the water by immersing the tail fin and moving it with a rudder like motion. There are two groups of flying fishes, both natives of tropical and subtropical seas. In one of the groups there are less than five species, while classed under the other there are fifty or more. End of section twenty three. End of Birds and Nature, Volume 8, Number 3, October 1900.